Nejan Baki uh, from the Bangladesh Army to speak to us on the trends in warfare, concept of victory and strategic conquest. Esteemed audience, I feel fortunate to be standing here, coming all the way from Bangladesh, that too in clause. Most part of my career, I admired Field Marshal Manik Shaw and made innumerable mention of him, a towering figure in our war of liberation. And I do appreciate that the patience is a very valued commodity. It rounds out very soon. I still remember I used to give a click and before going to the bed. In the morning I used to wake up and I got my movie downloaded. For my son, he clicks within one minute the movie gets downloaded. And today I have seen 1000 clicks to do something. So people are wanting everything so fast that patience, I mean, people do not really want to hold their hearts. And I know I am seeing the mood of the audience. It runs out very quickly once you hear a free lecture. And my lecture is the bridge between this time and uh, the lunch. So I don't know how to engage yourself really very positively, but I shall try to do that. And in doing so, I shall take a very storytelling approach not a very theorist approach. Please bear with me. And please give me a chance to justify my two and a half hours flight from Dhaka to Delhi. One irony is uh, I have been doing uh, courses in United States, in UK and Korea. Everywhere I had my course mate from India and my best friends. They used to tell me, when are you coming to India? Most of my, most of my course mates have done courses in India but I could not do. The irony is I have just retired in the month of January and now I am here at Delhi. Still, I am fortunate. So, ladies and gentlemen, war is a social contrast to unleash violence. This violence has been collective, direct, intentional, organized, sanctioned, regulated, and sometimes ritualized. We observe these conflicts has been going on between human groups from the very beginning of the human history. Why we fight is a matter of debate. Theories range from genetically driven to socially created one. For whatever reason we fight, the fact of the conflict is undeniable whilst its external manifestations vary. Patterns of conflict, purposes, and end states have all varied through the thousand years of human existence. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall take you along for a very short historical tour to recap the trends in warfare. No, I do, we do not go back to thousand years of human existence of hunter-gatherer, pastoral, agricultural societies. Let us take a pre-industrial society frame to start with the hundred years war a series of conflicts from 1337 to 1453 waged between rulers of England and the French at the start and the dawn of modern warfare. The wars manifested national identity alongside support and loyalty of the nation state as a whole. In the late 18th and early 19th century with the industrial age kick starting with the advent of refined weaponry and technology, new warfare tactics began to emerge such as line infantry groupings and the mixed order formation employed by Napoleon. This cutting has provided a leg up for the French in the conflict against a coalition of Brits, Prussians and Swedes. The Crimean War in 1853 saw the rapid decline of cavalry as significance was placed on heavy artillery. Heavy artillery offense from behind troop line formations and the introduction of naval shells. With the introduction of steam, both the volume and the speed of tactics increased. As backup, consistent support of war industries became very crucial. 
The Russo Turkish War of 1877-78 saw introduction of loaded rifles equipped with repeating fire rounds, taking another step forward in weapon modernization. The tedious trench warfare of World War I found some relief with the introduction of British tanks. German biplanes and Japlins added the third dimension of the warfare to the entry level. World War II found full-blown armored ship with accompanying synergistic air support. The shopping of the little boy heralded the end of World War II, but the next half of the century the world spent each moment in pent-up breath under the democratic sword of nuclear weapons. We grew up observing the inventions of rockets. The development such as satellites in the outer space and landing on moon, US and USSR started vying for supremacy in the new domain called outer space. After the invention of computers and widespread access to the internet, the cyber domain joined the League of Warfare domains in the second half of the 20th century and the early 21st century, thus increasing the number of warfare domains to five. Improvements in the miniaturization and data handling capacity of digital information systems throughout the 1990s gave rise to the concept of network-centric warfare. During the Gulf War in 1991, this technological upper hand gave the United States forces a decisive advantage over Iraqi forces. An Iraqi army that had stood up to eight years of combat with Iran collapsed rapidly. The wars against the former Yugoslavia, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan and Iraq, the U.S. demonstrated its unchallenged ability to conduct devastating, large-scale, precision-guided missiles and bomb strikes. Therefore, the procurement and assimilation of cutting-edge smart weapon and equipment became the ultimate modernization goal of all the armies of the world to keep pace with modern war fighting. At this point of time, we find emerging technical innovations which have the potential to fundamentally alter the character of the world, such as robots, drones, directed energy weapons, genetically engineered clones, and nanotechnology. Aircraft, warships, and armored vehicles could operate without human crews, and robots may take over from fallible human beings in the network that links surveillance, acquisition, and target engagement. Future looks like systems are gradually becoming autonomous, and the word of algorithm is in the offing. In this environment, in future only computer scientists may become soldiers. Network-centric warfare became centerpiece of land warfare after the Iraq and Afghanistan, but then the preceding years were manifesting different realizations and facts on the ground. The emerging dominant kind of warfare in this period was much more insurgency. That is high intensity, low-tech warfare. This was experienced in Somalia, in Rwanda, and continuing into Zaire, Congo, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, and then in Iraq at an accelerating rate from April 2003 to the present. The continuing war in Afghanistan is of the same nature. The weapons of choice by the insurgents tend to be the standard trio of AK-47s, RPG-7s, and mortars plus the roadside improvised explosive devices in Iraq. High-tech sensors and communication systems, as well as precision bombing, could play a useful role in conventional and land warfare, but could not substitute for large numbers of relatively low-tech light infantry soldiers. 70% of U.S. casualties in Iraq was due to improvised roadside bombs is proof enough of this trend. Irregular fighters have also proved adept at exploiting the technology of the information age. Al-Qaeda created its own form of sophisticated network warfare, giving its campaign a global reach that was impossible for earlier terrorist groups. It maintained affiliated sales in over 40 countries, coordinated and motivated through the exploitation of communication system. The group used the internet to facilitate financial transfers, recruit and train fighters, and pass encrypted instructions and intelligence. Most contemporary war zones are populated by disparate groups of irregular fighters with differing objectives and motivations. The insurgents in Iraq, for example, include Sunni and Shiite militias, Al-Qaeda jihadists, 
and the criminal gangs. If we zoom into the soil of Africa, we find a different dynamics altogether. In some recent words, entire ethnic or religious communities have been targeted in campaigns of terror, a trend stimulated by the collapse of central governments and the splintering of states along ethnic, religious, or tribal lines after 1990. Many contemporary conflicts, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, resemble large-scale turf wars between rival criminal gangs and bear little resemblance to the popular image of warfare. Let us move towards Latin America. This is the case in Colombia where Marxist-Leninist insurgents have merged with the major narcotic traffic, trafficking gangs. Urban terrorism, rather than rural-based insurgency, is now the dominant form of irregular warfare. To an extent, this is the result of accelerating global urbanization, but it also reflects contemporary terrorist desire to cause the maximum number of civilian casualties. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we may now ponder on the concept of victory and conquest. Derived from Latin victoria, from Vinco Victus, to conquer, the word victory is mostly associated with fighting, battle, and competition. So, the common understanding of victory is winning, to prevail, to triumph, or success. The objective and the purpose of the war or armed conflict is a political matter. Victory should therefore be considered within the context of the political aim. War and victory are about statecraft rather than only hostilities. Victory consists not solely of overcoming the enemy forces. It must include the attainment of the objective for which the war was waged. Claude Wiz described military victory as a condition where the enemy's ability to enter battle, resist or resume hostilities is destroyed. The concept summarizes the paradigm of success that preceded Claude Wiz and survived through much of the 20th century. Despite increasingly paradoxical outcomes in the last century and the current one, military planners, strategists, and statesmen sought answers for failures in different places. Only a few questioned the validity of the notion of victory that Clausewitz had so veritably summarized. The fundamental question that begs an answer is, what is victory? War is complex. Victory is, is diversely defined and can be influenced by society and in the end is founded on a common understanding of how a conflict is supposed to end. Is a war won by the armed forces of one side capitulating and laying down their arms? In a traditional sense, a war is won by a signature on a piece of paper. For some words, victory means deposing the other side's political system and replacing it with one of the victors choosing. The definition of winning may be based on metrics of violence and stability within a country at a given point. To some, it may equate to a balance scale of blood and treasure. We may pose a question. Did the Allies win the World War I because the enemy laid down their arms and signed the Treaty of Versailles? Twenty years later, that same enemy re-emerged with similar ambitions, leading the world into a costlier war. In hindsight, it seems such a war victory was in fact not a victory, but just a temporary break. For many, the end of Second World War resembles the epitome of a clear grand strategic victory that restructured the world order and shaped our image of victory. However, during the Cold War, the realization emerged that the concept of victory had no longer any practical significance in the context of nuclear weapons. No victory would be worth the price, its mutually assured destruction. The concept of victory and winning is no more, no more complicated and mystifying than in counterinsurgency warfare. In large part, this is due to the non-state composition of the enemy, and counterinsurgency warfare is hardest to define using metrics to indicate progress towards a stated goal.
Wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have illustrated that strategic success cannot be achieved by military force alone and that victory requires not only the defeat of the opponent's military capabilities but also the successful resolution of the deeper problems at the root of the conflict. There is a need for fresh thinking about the implications of the fourth industrial revolution for international security. Professor Klaus Schwab, chairman or founder of the World Economic Forum, argues that the collapse of barriers between digital and physical and between synthetic and organic constitutes a fourth industrial revolution, promising a level of change comparable to that brought about by steam power, electricity and computing. The experience of past industrial revolutions can help us begin to search for answers about how this will transform the wider context of international security. In first industrial revolution, deposit of coal and iron ore were one factor determining the winners in terms of economic and geographical power. Today, new modes of artifacts of industrial production will also change demand patterns empowering countries controlling supply and transit and disempowering others. Progress in energy production and storage efficiency, for instance, is likely to have profound consequences for the petro economies and the security challenges of their regions. Although the set of natural resources critical to strategic industries will change, their use as a geoeconomic tool will probably be repeated. In the 20th century, the haves and have-nots of the nuclear weapons club membership became the major determinant of the post-war global order. And as seen in the cases of Iran and North Korea today, this continues to be the re relevant. Stealth technology and precision-guided missiles used to impose a new world order in the early 1990s showed how the gap in military capability separated the United States from others, sustaining its leadership of a unipolar world. Stories about killer robots, machine augmented heroes, laser weapons, and battle in space, artificial intelligence, the potential for developing lethal autonomous weapon system grabs headlines. But the greatest impact of artificial intelligence on conflict may be socially mediated. Algorithmically driven social media connections funnel individuals into a transnational but culturally enclosed eco-chambers, radicalizing their worldview. It is worth quoting from the book, Victory, the Triumph and Tragedy of Just War. The specter of these apparently endless words gives us cause to consider whether the notion of victory has any purchase or meaning in. Since the early 20th century, the view has emerged that when it comes to the mechanized mass slaughter of modern warfare, nobody wins. As Aristide Briand, Prime Minister of France said, I quote, in modern war, there is no victor. Defeat reaches out its heavy hand to the uttermost corners of the earth and lays its burdens on victor and vanquish alike. I conclude quoting Jean Paul Sartre. He wrote in 1964 in Aces in Aesthetics, once you hear the details of victory, it is hard to distinguish it from a defeat. Thank you very much. Agent Baki has actually taken us through the historical perspective of the development of weapon systems and the mechanisms, how warfare domains came to become the fifth domain, that is the cyber, uh, when that was introduced, and the unmanned systems of various tasks, as he mentioned, from the emerging technologies. He also made a mention about the how terrorist groups, Al-Qaeda, uh, created their own nets to operate, as also the others. 
and the factors that result in intrastate conflicts the world over. He was at length to speak about the concept of victory, whether it was against a conventional war or with a nuclear backdrop or in a counter-insurgency environment. And he made a mention that in the case of an insurgency environment, we need to address, uh, carry out a resolution based on addressing the prominent root causes of a conflict, which may actually mean that we have addressed the problem. You spoke at length about the lethal autonomous weapon system being developed. So I think he actually has been able to cover a very vast